Good morning. Sorry for the late start. Coffee is excellent. <coughs> wow. I guess I haven't talked yet today. My voice sounds a little raspy. So I hope you guys have had a good day so far. And if you haven't, I hope it gets better. I hope um, as we invite our friends, some will show up. <laughs> but everybody that's supposed to hear it hears it. I, I am so blessed. Oh, 6.15. Really late. I'm really blessed by all of you guys that comment and share and like the page. It's really awesome. Um, I love and appreciate all of you and all of your awesome comments. And I hope that today's message will impact you and change you for the better for today. So here we go. We are going to be in 1 Kings 22, and we are going to go ahead and open in prayer. Lord, I just thank you for today, and I thank you for your word. I thank you that you're my constant. I thank you that I can come before you each and every day and know that you're there and know that you care about me and know that you meet me where I'm at each and every day. And Lord, I just ask that you would help me to understand your word. You would help me to apply it to my life. You would help me to share it in everyday circumstances and that you would give me joy and peace and patience and love for those around me and for myself. And, and Lord, I just ask that you would continue to grow my relationship with you, that I would be more like you each and every day. And when I fail and fall short, I pray that you would help me to forgive myself so I can ask for forgiveness and, and be forgiven by you. And Lord, I just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we are in 1 Kings 22. Good morning, Randy. Glad that you're here. 1 Kings 22. Ahab and the false prophets. So for three years, Syria and Israel continued without war. So there was peace in the land. But in the third year, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. Now, rec remember that after Solomon, Rehoboam, and Jeroboam split the kingdom, um, Jeroboam took the northern tribes, the kingdom of Israel and Rehoboam Solomon's son took the kingdom of Judah and so since then the kingdom has been split and so now we still have Ahab who is an evil king he doesn't really listen to God and he does his own thing um, he is down in Judah and we have Jehoshaphat, the king of Israel. And now he's coming and they're going to go and they're having a powwow. And the king of Israel said to his servants, do you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us? And we keep quiet and do not take it out of the hand of the king of Syria. And he said to Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to battle at Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Now this is a big thing because now he's saying that uh, the king of Israel is saying that he will support and battle with the king of Judah, almost uniting the countries, right? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, inquire first for the word of the Lord. Oh, what a novel idea. Unfortunately, Ahab really doesn't have any idea how to inquire of the Lord because he is an evil king. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go to battle against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? And they said, Go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here another prophet of the Lord of whom we may inquire? So, why is he asking for another prophet when he assembled 400 prophets? What, what's the difference? Well, if you read, then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, he, they were just prophets. They weren't prophets of the Lord. They didn't necessarily give the word of the Lord, though they, they stamp it with, the Lord will give it into the hand of the king, but they didn't really, they don't really say that these men are from God. So just because someone says 
God's name and says God approves doesn't necessarily mean that person's from God or that word is from God. So that's why the king says, is there not another prophet? Good morning, Wendy. Glad that you're here. We're in 1 Kings um, chapter 22. And so he's looking for another prophet, a prophet of the Lord, a prophet that will possibly give God's word. So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah, the son of Imla. But I hate him. I hate him for he never prophesies good concerning me, but evil. You know, it's, it's not the prophet's fault for giving his words that are not his words, but God's words, and they're not necessarily evil on him. They're evil because he's evil and what he's doing is wrong. So don't get upset when the word given is a condemnation on you when you're not right with God. That's where they were. So, hates him. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. And then the king of Israel summoned an officer and said, bring quickly Micaiah, the son of Imla. And now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones, arrayed in their robes, at the threshing floor, at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets were prophesying before them. And Zedekiah, the son of Chaniah, made for himself horns of iron and said, thus says the Lord. With these you shall push the Syrians until they are destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied so and said, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. So all these prophets are still saying, Go do it. You got this. Go, go, king. You know, go fight. Go fight win, right? Well, and I think I said it wrong. So Judah, Jehoshaphat's the king of Judah. And the king of Israel, but in the third year, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. So Judah and Israel. Okay, let's just continue. Um, verse 13, Micaiah prophesies against Ahab. Because his words are all, he hates him because his words are always bad concerning him. Well, maybe because he's a bad guy. And the messenger who went to summon Micaiah said to him, Behold, the words of the prophets with one accord are favorable to the king. So they're trying to tell him, Hello, hello, Micaiah. Everybody's saying good things. So let's get on the good thing boat and don't give your bad prophecies right now. Let your word be like the word of one of them and speak favorably. Say nice things, Micaiah. You're always a downer. That's what they're trying to say. But Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that I will speak. And you know, that is such a huge verse to me because it's not my words, but God's words. And I can't say whatever I want to say because maybe what I want to say is, oh, it's okay. I understand. You know, God will understand. It's all right. Don't do, don't worry about it. But God's word says, you're wrong. It's not okay. This is not right. And you know, when I get into a situation where I'm going to have to say something like that, it is what it is. And, and you know, I, I can't not say what God has told me to say. So therefore, either I don't say anything at all if I'm not asked, because if I'm not asked, then my opinion doesn't isn't required. But if I'm asked, the gate's opened, you know. So he tells him, I can't only say what the Lord tells me to say. And when, verse 15, and when he had come to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, Shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall we refrain? And he answered him, go up and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. That's kind of how he said it. But the king said to him, how many times shall I make you swear that you speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Whoa. Okay. Now, hello. You are the one that wanted to hear only good things. Okay. Okay. And he said, I saw all Israel. This is his 
true version now. I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each return to his home in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? And Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said one thing and another said another. And then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, by what means? And he said, I will go out and will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, you are to entice him and you shall succeed. Go out and do so. So now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets. The Lord has declared disaster on you. What? That's pretty intense. So he's not even just calling out Ahab for being evil. He's saying all these prophets are fallen to a lying spirit and are lying to your face because they are liars. So he's not just throwing, good morning, Jennifer, glad that you're here. He's not just throwing Ahab under the bus. He threw every single one of those 400 prophets under the bus as well. They're all evil. They're all lying. And Ahab, you're an evil king period. That's pretty bold and pretty harsh, you know, and, um, but it's not his word. You know, God gave him this word to speak. God is trying to give Ahab a wake up call. Look, I know what happened. I know what you're doing. I know what you think. I know what's being allowed to happen because you're evil and this lying enticing spirit wouldn't trap you and, and cause you to fall if your heart was right with God. You are able, you are, you have, you will fall because your heart is far from God. When we're, when we're close to God, when we seek God, when we're wanting to be right with God, then then the lying enticing spirits, we see them coming and we say, get behind me, Satan. I'm not listening to you. But when we're far from God and when our anger overtakes us and our bitterness shuts us off and we don't know what to do, we listen to the lying spirits. And God is telling you, here I am. I'm giving you a wake-up call. I, these lying spirits are out there, but you have the power to defeat them. You've already won. Just say no right? Just say no to the lying spirit. Listen to the truth of the word of God. So verse 24, then Zedekiah, the son of Chaniah came near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, how did the spirit of the Lord go from me to speak to you? So I guess this guy's a little pissed that Micaiah has pretty much called him a liar. And Micaiah said, behold, you shall see on that day when you go into an inner chamber to hide yourself. And the king of Israel said, seize Micaiah and take him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, thus says the king, put this fellow in prison and feed him meager rations of bread and water till I come in peace. And Micaiah said, if you return in peace, the Lord has not spoken to me. And he said, hear all you peoples. So pretty much he has sealed his fate by his words from the Lord that he is going to be in prison probably for the rest of his days eating meager rations of bread and water because Ahab will never come back in peace. And, you know, that's kind of where it's at. So we see Ahab is killed in battle. So therefore Micaiah is stuck in jail. But Micaiah has done his purpose, you know. We don't hear anything more about Micaiah, but that's okay because Micaiah accomplished his purpose and God was there for him and is there for him and, and saw him through. And who knows how long he lived. He probably didn't live much longer because that was his purpose. You see, nothing more is recorded of Micaiah. So therefore, when our purpose is accomplished here, we go home. So Ahab is killed in battle. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle. But you wear your robes. And the king of Israel disguised himself, 
went into battle. Now the king of Syria had commanded the 32 captains of his chariots, fight with neither small nor great, but only with the king of Israel. And when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they said, it is surely the king of Israel. So they turned to fight against him and Jehoshaphat cried out. And when the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him. But a certain man drew his bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the scale armor and the breastplate. Therefore he said to the driver of his chariot, Turn around and carry me out of the battle, for I am wounded. And the battle continued that day, and the king was propped up in his chariot facing the Syrians until at evening he died. And the blood of the wound, 630s. Sorry we're so late today. And the battle and the blood of the wound flowed into the bottom of the chariot, and about sunset a cry went through the army, every man to his city and every man to his country. So the king died and was brought to Samaria and they buried the king in Samaria and they washed the chariot by the pool of Samaria and the dogs licked up his blood. And if you recall, that is exactly what was prophesied would happen to Ahab, that his blood would be licked up by the dogs because he was so evil. You know, before it happened, he had every opportunity to change. That's why God gives us the word. You know, this is what's going to happen. Not that you have to do it, but that you have the opportunity to change. God gives us our, his word now. Not that you have to be in eternal separation from God, but that you can have eternal life with God if you choose to listen and obey his word. Ahab choose to disobey his word, and therefore the dogs are looking up his blood in the streets. And this one's gross. The prostitutes wash themselves in it according to the word of the Lord that he had spoken. These are prostitutes that were like temple prostitutes for these evil gods. Um, now the rest of the acts of Ahab and all that he did, the ivory house that he built and all the cities that he built, are they not written in the book of Chronicles, the kings of Israel? So Ahab slept with his fathers and Ahaziah, his son, reigned in his place. So Jehoshaphat reigns in Judah. Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, began to reign over Judah in the fourth year of Ahab, king of Israel. Now, Jehoshaphat was 30 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. So Jehoshaphat I think I said it backwards, but Jehoshaphat is the king of Jerusalem and Judah in the, in the south. And Asa was the king of Israel in the north of the ten tribes. His mother's name was Azuba, the daughter of Shilhai. He walked in all the way of Asa, his father. He did not turn aside from doing it, doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. Yet the high places were not taken away, and the people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places. Jehoshaphat also made peace with the king of Israel. Okay, so he is in the chosen land. He's in Jerusalem, the city of God, right, where that's where the temple's at. He was a good guy. He followed after God like his dad, who was a good guy. But he didn't remove the evil that was in his land. And it was within his power to do so. He could have removed all of those idols, all of those temples of worship. Maybe he would have been less popular. But he would have been right with God. And though there was peace in the land between him and Israel, you know, he missed the opportunity to completely remove the evil from his people. Though he was good, the evil was still there. And the evil still continued on from generation to generation. So though you may have a relationship with God, if you don't break the chains of bondage of the sin that's in your life and allow those things to carry on, even if you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, those things will carry on. So you need to self-evaluate and look at your life and make sure there's things that are not of God that you're carrying on and passing on to the next generation, right? So there was no king in Edom. A deputy was king. Jehoshaphat made ships of Tarshish to go to Ophir for gold. But, oops, they did not go for the ships were wrecked at Ezon Geber. Then Ahaz 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 Ahaziah Ahaziah, 
there we go. Then Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, let my servants go with your servants in the ships. But Jehoshaphat was not willing. And Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father, and Jeho Je Jehoram, Jehoram, his son, reigned in his place. So all we get about um, Ahaziah is that he was a good guy. Um, Jehoshaphat reigned in his place. Azuba, another Joseph reigned, king of Edom. So he was a good guy. And he didn't want to let Ahab's people go with them. Ahaziah, the son of Ahab. So that's how it happened. Ahaziah was the son of Ahab. Ahab was up north, right? Okay, so let's see what's happened now. So now we see Jehoshaphat passed away. Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel and Samaria in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. Okay, so Ahaziah is the son of Ahab. Ahab was evil. Um, Jehoshaphat is good. He reigned two years over Israel. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in the way of his mother, Jezebel, both evil, and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. He served Baal and worshipped him and provoked the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger in every way that this father had done. So all the evil that was passed down from his parents was summed up in him, and he continued to do the evil all the days of his life, it looks like, so far. That's where we're leaving him. We're leaving Israel with this evil, evil king who's just evil because his parents were evil, and they just allowed those that evil intentions and consequences to pass down to his child, their children. So... That's a lovely note to leave the Old Testament on, but we're going on to the New Testament. The New Testament is in Acts 13, 16 through 41. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, and if you remember yesterday, we left him in the tabernacle, which meant he was in the, left him in the temple, in the synagogue. He was in the synagogue. So he's preaching there, okay? So the men of Israel and you who fear God, listen, the God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt and with uplifted arm he led them out of it and for about 40 years he put up with them in the wilderness and after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan he gave them their land as an inheritance all this took about 450 years and after that he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet and then they asked for a king and God gave them Saul the son of Kish a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years and when he had been and when he had removed him he raised up David to be their king of whom he testified and said I have found in David the son of Jesse a man after my heart who will do all my will that's such an amazing beautiful thing to say because all of us should desire to be a person after God's heart. All of us should desire to do all of God's will. And David wasn't perfect. David fell short. David failed. David committed adultery. David committed murder. David allowed sins to happen with, amongst his children without discipline. David was not a great guy. but. When he failed, when he fell short, he would take himself before the Lord and ask for forgiveness. And that's the difference. That's the difference between an evil person and a person that has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You can come before the Lord. You can offer yourself there. You can ask for forgiveness and God restores and God sets you right. And that's the heart that God desires. And that's who David was. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance, John the Baptist, not John the disciple. Um, before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, what do you suppose that I am? 
I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. John the Baptist knew he was not the Messiah, but his purpose was to point others to the Messiah. And that should be our purpose today. Our purpose isn't to get honor and glory, but our purpose is to give God honor and glory, right? So brothers, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God to us, has been sent the message of this salvation for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets which are read every Sabbath fulfilled them by condemning him. Now he's including himself in this as well because they all condemned Jesus to death. And though they found him no guilt and though they found in him no guilt, worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree, laid him in a tomb, but, but God. And that's always the most amazing part. All these things may be happening to you. You may be in the midst of trials, in tribulations, on in the valley of the shadow of death, but God. But God, but God raised him from the dead. And for many days, he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And there was like 500 people that are documented seeing the risen Lord. And we bring you the good news that God promised to the fathers this he has fulfilled to us their children by raising Jesus as also it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another Psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. Jesus fulfilled all of these prophecies. Jesus fulfilled all the promises. And because Jesus is a promise keeper, he is a promise keeper in your life today. You have things that you don't understand or you fall short of, or you need a word and God gave you the word. It's Jesus Christ. He's the one that will help you to get through wherever you're at. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. Though David was a man after God's own heart, he died. He died. We are mortal people. Our bodies will pass away. With a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, when we close our eyes and we sleep with our fathers, when we die in this mortal body, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Our spirit will immediately be before the Lord. Our spirit does not die just this temporary body, right? And then when we our spirit goes before the Lord, we, are, we receive our new body, just like Jesus received his heavenly body, right? His glorified body. <laughs> so, but he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. The law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, everything that they followed to the T, all the rules and laws, they don't save you. They, they can't bring salvation. It just shows you how you fail and you fall short. But that's supposed to drive you closer to God because but God gives you forgiveness and God gives you salvation and God gives you hope. So yes, I failed this commandment, but because I have a relationship with God, I can go before my Lord and he will forgive me. And that is because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. From everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses, beware therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days of work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. Paul is warning them, I'm telling you, I'm telling you and connecting the dots for you, Jesus is frees us from our sins. Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus is the one that was sent to bridge the gap between us and God. We no longer are under the law. We are freed by Jesus Christ. He's trying to show them this and not just them, but us because we are the them. The same message that was preached 
right here in the book of Acts on this day is the same message that God gives us today. We have the ability to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and free us from the power of sin over our lives. It's a pretty exciting message, but that's where Paul leaves us off. And so then we go on to Psalms, Psalms 138, give thanks to the Lord. And this is a Psalm of David. So I give, th I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. And that's why he was a man after God's own heart. Before the gods I sing your praise, I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called you, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord, for though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. Not that you are depressed, not that you are a doormat, not that you are, you think less of yourself as a person. Lowly meaning you understand that God is God and you are not, that, that you are what you are by the grace of God, by the glory of God, by the wisdom of God. God has made you perfect just the way you are, but you, there's nothing within you that's worthy or deserving of eternal life, but it's a free gift that you readily accept because you understand that he is God and you are not. That's having a lowly spirit. That's understanding that how the position of things goes, right? But the haughty, he knows from afar. The haughty think, it's all about me. It, I, I am the chief. I can do all things. I, I, self-pride, self-respect, self-esteem, self, all about self. Now, are those things wrong? No, they're not wrong. As long as you understand self Respect, self-esteem comes from who you are in Christ, not from within yourself. It's not about you. It's all about God. So a haughty spirit is all about you. A lowly spirit is all about God. And he knows the haughty from afar. He's like, yeah, that's a haughty person. I see you over there. Yeah, you, yeah, you stay over there because you're haughty and I don't need you in my presence. That's God's perspective of the haughty, right? Because you're so big in your head and in your thoughts and who you are, there's no room to have God nearby, right? Because of your haughty spirit, you push away God. So though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch you and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O oh Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. What is the work of God's hands? Everything. Creation is the work of God's hands. Separating the light from the darkness. Waters over the, the face of separating the waters on the earth from the waters above. The stars in the sky, the planets, the moon and the stars and the sun, the people, the animals, the the sea and all the creatures within it, the birds that fly, the plants that grow, everything created is the work of his hands. And he will not forsake it. It seems for a time that global warming and cancer and, and terrorism and horrible things are overtaking all of us. And where is God in the midst of it? Well, I'll let you know where he is. He's right here with you. And you might say, well, why doesn't God do something? He, he did. He created you. And he put within your heart a, a need for you to see what's going on around you and step up. He did do something. He created you. What are you going to do with what God's given you in the midst of all that's going on? Because all these in the Bible did what God did asked of them in the midst of their situation. It wasn't about God as a genie changing everything, but it was about God using the willing people to accomplish his purpose. God gave them you. God gave you 
for whatever purpose is on your heart that weighs heavy within you of all of the terror or all of the hurt or the anger or the sickness or the whatever it is, God put it on your heart. What are you going to do about it? God did do something. He gave, he gave you. He, he, he put you here, right? So Proverbs 17, 17 through 18. A friend loves at all times. But a brother is born for adversity. Why, why is a brother born for adversity? Well, you know, you can't choose the family you're born into. You know, you're born into a family and, and um, that's what you get. And there is adversity and there's strife that drives family members apart. And God says, a brother is born for adversity. A friend loves at all times. A friend loves at all times is that, you know, they can see you for who you are. You can share fellowship with them, you know, and you can do the same with a brother. It's not that it's impossible, but you're not born. You're not born into a friendship. You have to create that friendship. You have to nurture that friendship. You have to make that friendship grow and a brother is born for adversity it's something that you can't change it's it's always there so there may be adversity between you and your brother that can't be solved because maybe there was not a friendship there to begin with and so one who lacks sense gives a pledge and puts up security in the presence of his neighbor if you don't have the sense to calculate out what you're pledging to give and do, you shouldn't do it. And especially if you do it in front of other people. If you say, I'm going to do this, and other people see and hear you, and you don't do it, and you're supposed to be a Christian, and you're supposed to represent God, then what happens when you fail and fall short? Well, you're misrepresenting God. So God is telling you, you lack sense. When you say you're going to do something, you don't do it. So either don't say you're going to do it or step up and be a person of your word. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Be who God has called you to be. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, not through yourself and your own strength. I hope that touches somebody's heart today. I hope that um, you have an excellent day and that you use what you've been given to give God honor and glory. Thank you so much for tuning in and I hope you have a very blessed day.